All right, uh, thanks very much. So uh, today I'll be talking about robust learning algorithms. And let's uh, start with uh, some motivating examples. Now, this is what happened in uh, April 2013. It's when the uh, Twitter account of uh, Associated Press was hacked. and sent out a fake tweet claiming that explosions happened at the White House, uh, causing the stock market to plunge, losing $100 plus billion dollars in stock value in a few minutes. Uh, it recovered pretty quickly after people realized it's fake. Um, it was believed that this was tri mostly triggered by automated trading algorithms. So these are algorithms that monitor uh, major news sites and their social network accounts and make trades based on those information uh, real time. Uh, while it was uh, revealed later in this case that the hacker only did it for fun, uh, you could totally uh, you could totally see people uh, trying to uh, repeat this attack. Uh, try to exploit these automated trading algorithms to make money in the stock market. Right. So um, um, there are other examples where machine learning systems are deployed in practice, and uh, but they're vulnerable to these adversarial attacks. So on the left hand side, you have a um, people try to use this uh, carefully designed glass frame to trick a commercial grade uh, facial recognition system. So on the top, you have you know, what the real uh, person, who the real person is, and uh, wearing this uh, uh, weird glasses. And on the bottom, you have what the software think, who the software think <laughs> the person is. Okay? And, um, right, so uh, these are uh, the two things on this slide are, are both neural nets. Um, so on the right hand side, you have self driving cars. Uh, and people, well, algorithm used in self driving cars, I guess. Or trying to get used, uh, the, uh, where people try to put black and white stickers on stop sign, and that will trick the algorithm to think it's a speed limit sign instead. So uh, just as you want to live in a play world where uh, your automated trading algorithm are not fooled by one single tweet, you probably want to live in a world where uh, the self-driving car can recognize whether it's a stop sign or not. Okay. So there is certainly demand for a robust learning algorithm. And in this talk, we're going to focus on much simpler uh, challenges and, uh, um, and uh, much more basic, uh, robust notions of uh, these machine learning problems. So let's take a look at uh, parameter estimation 101. So this is a setting where you have some underlying model and parameters, and your algorithm are trying to estimate these parameters. But instead of observing directly, the algorithm only gets to see some data generated uh, from these model and parameters. Okay, so sometimes. The problem is hard because before the algorithm can uh, use the data, the adversary comes in and change, say, a little bit of the input data. And sometimes there's no adversary in your system. Sometimes you just made a too strong assumption on your input data. So you assume it's a Gaussian, but it's actually something very close to Gaussian. Uh, and your goal is to still be able to recover uh, what you wanted to uh, recover um, in this case. Right. So as we'll see in this talk, um, doing so, uh, you know, design fast and provably robust learning algorithm would require uh, to bring ideas together from machine learning and optimization. Right. So um, in this talk, I'll just in the remaining ten minutes, I'll just uh, briefly cover uh, two of the recent work I did in the past year. The first one is on uh, matrix completion. Uh, this is motivated by uh, collaborative filtering, uh, so in recommendation system setting. Um, so this is uh, widely used in, say, by Amazon, recommending items for you to purchase based on your purchase history, or YouTube recommend video for you to watch. Right. So um, it's been, this approach has become popular uh, uh, during the Netflix challenge. Uh, and there, the setting was you have uh, collected some data on how your users uh, rate movies, and you want to recover the rest. Okay? The reason you believe this matrix uh, could be close to lo low rank is you think that uh, every movie has some feature, whether it's a horror movie or not, let's say, and every user has a preference uh, over those features, and the number of features is much smaller than the total number of movies. Right? Um, so you know, formally, I have this matrix M star. I observe a subset of entries, and I want to recover it. Uh, today, we're going to focus on the non-convex approach for this problem, because that's what people use in practice. Now, this just minimizes the least square error. Um, 
on those entries that you observe. Um, so the hope is that uh, you, you know, since if let's say every entry is revealed uh, independently with the same probability, this will be a proxy for the uh, square of Frobenius norm, which is the thing you actually want to minimize. Okay, uh, all previous work um, that analyzes non-convex approach make this uh, strong assumption that uh, every entry is observed with exactly the same probability p. So the main contribution of our work, one of the main contribution of our work, is to take a look at a semi-random setting of this problem, where, uh, let's say, in the first step, uh, nature flips, flips coins and reveal every entry with the same probability. Okay. On top of this, adversary would examine your algorithm and you know, the underlying matrix and what's revealed, and reveal additional entry to you. And as a, as a result, your algorithm only gets to observe the combined um, set of entries uh, revealed both by nature and the adversary. So here it's important that the adversary cannot change the entries. It can just give you additional entries to try to mess you up. Okay. All right. So it's almost equivalent to uh, allowing the adversary to set different probabilities for revealing each entry. Okay. Um, almost equivalent. All right, so uh, there are two main messages of our work. So the first one is to say that uh, in this setting, even I just allow the adversary to reveal additional entries, uh, existing non-convex algorithms are not robust uh, in this case. So very roughly speaking, is um, uh, previous work have shown that if these entries are revealed by IID, your objective function looks very nice. Uh, it's non-convex, but all of its local optima uh, are globally optimal as well. So you can formally prove this. Uh, however, if the adversary tried to reveal you, say, a lot more entries on the diagonal block, this would actually destroy the uh, underlying structure of the non-convex objective function we saw on the last slide. It will create uh, these uh, uh, bad local optima pointed out by the red arrows. Um, that will be a problem for you, let's say, if, when you're just running gradient descent. All right, that's message one. Um, message two is that, um, so in light of this, we can actually uh, fix these non-convex approaches while preserving their efficiency. So uh, very roughly what we do is um, uh, when we see this input, we're actually going to ignore uh, all the matrix entry, the, va the value of those entries we observe. We just look at the pattern of observation. Okay? We're going to feed it into a pre-processing algorithm. And the preprocessing algorithm will output a weighted uh, version of these input uh, that kind of counter uh, the balance, counter the influence of the adversary. And if you run it, your algorithm on the weighted non-convex objective function given by this preprocessing -pre step, your objective function is going to uh, become uh, good again. So that after this preprocessing -pre step, all the local optima are going to be approximately uh, global optima. Okay. All right. Uh, that's the first uh, result that I'm going to mention. Okay. Questions? Yeah. So are you saying, suppose that I have a two-way two matrix. Are you saying that if I observe, you know, the probability one, uh, one half, one half, one half, three quarters, you just artificially make it one half again? Uh, yeah, in some sense. Uh, but the point, the point here is, uh, that's correct. Uh, that's what I want to do. But the difficulty here is that uh, you don't really know the PIJs. You only know uh, they're, they're all larger than P. But you don't know. Um, so you're trying to set, you're trying to uh, preprocess your data so that um, you get a random observation, a set of random, random observations back. Okay. So if you knew the probabilities, you can just um, set them you can just subsample or something and uh, get an ID observation back. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, so now let's move on to the uh, second part of the talk, where um, uh, where, where I'm going to talk about robust high-dimensional statistics. So. Um, uh, the one of the uh, examples that I like most that motivates this uh, line of work is the uh, following. So this is a famous study conducted in Nature in 2008, 
where people took the genetic data of uh, 1,500, uh, after filtering, 1,500 European citizens, and uh, plotted out their, um, uh, took the top two uh, singular vector of that data and plotted out on a two-dimensional uh, space. And it mirrors, uh, the conclusion made is the uh, gene mirror geography. So you get the map of Europe back. Um, however, I'm sorry. However, as we all know, the top singular vector essentially me measures the direction that maximizes the variance. So this approach is actually very sensitive to outliers. So um, people, uh, researchers in our community show that if you just uh, add a few points that's uh, pretty far away from everybody else, then that's going to totally shatter the map of Europe. And uh, similar to the previous motivation that I described, in this case, you probably want to uh, have an algorithm that can still approximately recover the map of Europe, uh, despite you have these uh, noisy outliers in your data. Right. So this is actually a special case of uh, robust uh, covariance estimation. But I'm not going to talk about that. All right. So um, what I will talk about is uh, 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 the simplest task you can have in statistics is that I estimate the mean of a distribution. So um, you know, I just have a high dimensional Gaussian, spherical Gaussian, I have samples from it I want to uh, estimate its mean. We understand this problem very well. We know, you know uh, how many samples we need to take, um, and empirical mean works. So what do I mean when I say robust mean estimation? So I just meant after the adversary sees the data and your algorithm, the adversary can change, let's say, 1% of the data up to arbitrary points. And you get to see uh, just the remaining blue points and the red points. Um, you can't distinguish them, um, but the, your goal is to recover a new star. Okay. All right. So this is uh, interesting because it's a uh, you know a uh, fundamental statistical question, and B people showed that uh, it's it can be used as subroutine to solve a lot of uh, supervised learning problems, just because you can think of gradient as the uh, some kind of mean mean of some function on your data. And if you can robustly estimate the gradient, you can robustly do gradient descent. All right, so um, don't read this. Uh, the, the, the main result is that we, uh, can, uh, we can give algorithms for this problem that achieve the uh, optimal or near optimal guarantees in all three aspects. So the, uh, the, your error at the end of the day, uh, how close the, your, your, the mean output by your algorithm is close to the true mean. Uh, your sample complexity and the running time of your algorithm. Okay. So it's tied up to constant or polylog factor depending on whether there's a tilde there or not. Um, all right. So um, I'll zoom out a little bit. So the way I view this, uh, what this work does to the um, in the community is um, uh, robust statistics is a problem that dates back to the 60s at least, uh, where who, uh, to Tuki and Hoover who asked this question without caring about computational complexity. And um, people in the TCS community three years ago at least are able to provide polynomial time algorithm that uh, robustly estimate the uh, you know, different things of distributions. Um, the hope here is that we can start a line of work that will not only uh, stops at polynomial time, but also try to push this as uh, quickly as possible or as practical as possible to uh, have algorithms that run as efficient as the non-robust ones. Okay. So um, right, I briefly mentioned the results. I didn't ask you to read them for mean estimation. Uh, we can do this for covariance estimation as well, but there are many other things that we don't know. I don't know how to do uh, yet, or to have a very practical algorithm for this as well. All right, to summarize, so. Um, Basically, in this talk, we've seen two examples where you have a learning problem. And you either have an adversary that changes your input, or you, made, uh, or you want your algorithm to work when there's a slight model uh, misspecification. And unfortunately, in both cases, if you just run the traditional algorithm, uh, maybe the best non-convex or just empirical mean, your algorithm would, or empirical covariance, your algorithm would fail in both cases. But fortunately, is you can use techniques from uh, optimization that will give you nearly linear time algorithms uh, that allow you to recover uh, the optimal solution, or approximately optimal solution. So you can have fast and provable robust algorithms in both cases. And that concludes my talk. Thanks very much. Thank you.